Ready to get into the Word? You know, we finished up our series last week on a um, series that I've been calling What Is, you know, where we just looked at sort of defining and redefining for us if we've lost track of it, some things that are are critical to who we are as Christians. So I really enjoyed teaching through that. And, you know, I've been praying and seeking the Lord about what's the next thing, what's the next series, what's the next book of the Bible we're going to teach through. And, you know, God's given me some some leading on that, but I'm I'm being careful of what I jump into right now because here's the thing, when, you know, when you commit to something like that, you're committing to you know, depending on what we're doing, it could be six months worth of teaching. It could be, you know, so I'm really um, praying and seeking God about that. But for this week, I felt like the Lord just laid this simple word of encouragement on our hearts for this week. And it's in Second Timothy chapter four. And now I know that Timothy is a pastoral epistle, meaning it was addressed to a pastor. So not all of it is like, not all of it is totally applicable to everything that you're going to be dealing with, but much of it is. Much of it is about godly character and what to avoid in terms of useless conflict and things like that. So there is a lot of it. Now, Second Timothy chapter 4, it starts out with this instruction to this young pastor, but then how Paul starts to to tell him how to navigate that and the tools to use, I feel like it's so powerful for all of us. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, starting out, it says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in the view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Well, we could spend all day on that because we've obviously seen that occurring within the body of Christ. But I want to go on to this next like package of instructions that Paul gives to Timothy. He says, but you, and let me extend it past just Timothy and say, but to you, but to me, but to you, Keep your head in all situations. I love that. Keep your head in all situations. What a simple and amazingly powerful piece of advice. Keep your head. Don't lose it. Whatever mess you find yourself in, don't lose it. Keep your head, stay calm, and make prayerful, thoughtful, and godly decisions. Amen? Don't let fear or anger or despair make the decision for you. Things may not be working out how you thought they would, or even how they legitimately should. Paul's telling Timothy to keep his head in situations where he would even be legitimately being wronged. Later on in this chapter, Paul deals with it with his own heart and his own self that he had been deserted by people who he loved and leaned on. Like, And it was wrong. It shouldn't have happened to him. You might be going through things right now that are legitimately wrong. They're not fair. You're, you know... Keep your head, though. Keep your head, and don't let that, dis- that disappointment or that anger or that, that, you know, what we like to call righteous indignation even, right? 
Don't let it take you out of who and what God wants you to be and do. Keep your head in those situations. You know, a, a while back, and I, I've, I've kind of mentioned certain aspects of this before in, in messages, but just it, the fruit of it keeps coming up into my life. But a while back, a couple years ago, I think, I heard everybody was in therapy. Like I went to a, um, I went to our national convention and like three out of the four key speakers talked about time they were spending with their therapist. And honestly, my thoughts were so simple. It was this, it was, if all these awesome people are doing this, maybe I should too. So I got connected with a very good, well-known therapist. And honestly, initially the experience of it was something that I didn't totally enjoy or value. Because I was going there expecting to like lean back on the couch, tell them how horrible my childhood was, and you know, you know, how terrible my mother was. Sorry, mom. <laughs> it's what I wanted to do. It's not true, but you know, that's what you see, you know? It's like I want the full experience. So, you know, that's what I was expecting to happen during that time. And instead, I mean, I would get like 30 seconds into that and it was all about just tools and being equipped to move past that and how to not, you know, and I'm like, wait a minute, I want to vent here, you know? Like I'm paying good money for this, I want, you know? And it just wasn't that way. But one of the things that he, he taught me about, and it wasn't the first time I had heard it, but it was, it was like the confirmation I needed to go ahead and try it was just to take some time and breathe in certain situations. You know, since then, I've learned all this science about it and not good enough to teach it, but sort of good enough to understand it. And I've even hired coaches to speak to pastors in my area about it when we were doing Zoom conferences together. But it's like God has made us in such a way that if we will just, when it comes to like keeping your head in a situation, when you feel like reacting, if you can just take a little bit and just breathe, just breathe deep. When you're in a conflict with your spouse and you feel like just firing back and it's gonna go into that back and forth type situation, right? If you wanna make it to 51 years, like, like Pastor Frank and Pastor Dora, then take some time to breathe in those situations to keep your head. It's amazing to me how well it works. If I just stop, if I just stop. You know, <clears throat> um, there's this term that I didn't come up with it, but I use it a lot lately. And it's so funny because um, I was talking with somebody this morning and they used the exact same term. And I said, hey, that was already in my sermon. So don't think that I just, you know, but I call it spiraling. And maybe because I'm aware of it now, like when you get a minivan and all of a sudden you see everybody in town has the exact same minivan as you because now you're looking for it. You know, maybe it's because I'm aware of it because I'm trying not to do it now. But I see so often people just start spiraling something's not going right. And they're like, oh my goodness, this is so terrible. And you can tell it's spiraling because when people start spiraling, even the good things in their life start becoming bad to them. You know, I'm a stupid dog, you know, or whatever. I mean, it could be anything. It just, you're spiraling. It's like you're going out of control. And it's in those situations that you need to stop and keep your head, Right? God has good things for you. God has good plans for you. I, again, it's not even because Pastor Jack happens to be here today, but one time I was in such a turmoil, such a conflict with this issue with my church council, which, you know, was probably, they were probably giving me some good counsel in that, and I probably had some good points, but I was just so frustrated about the whole thing. And I remember I started just doing that spiral, right? 
And I called Pastor Jack for advice, but he quickly discerned that I hadn't called him for advice. I had called him to vent, right? <laughs> and I'm just like, ah. And you know it's spiraling when you won't listen to any of the advice that's coming at you. You just want to continue to spiral, right? And finally, I, I don't think I remember Pastor Jack getting upset with me too many times. But it, in this case, not like he was mad, but I could, I could hear like a little frustration in his voice when he said, just lead through it. And that's this thing. It's like, keep your head. God has a way through it. God has a word for you. God has direction for you. The word of God is filled with every bit of knowledge you need. Just keep your head in those situations. From then on, every time I get into a frustrating spot like that, those words that kind of, they came with a little bit of a sting in that moment, which helps sometimes, right? The sting helps it stick sometimes, right? And so many times, I, I feel like it's weekly when I'll get to those places of just like, oh, you know, I, those words come back to me, lead through it. Stop for a moment. God certainly has a direction to move in at this point, right? Keep your head in all situations. The reality is this, is that you do have an enemy of your soul in the devil who is trying to destroy you. And as soon as he can get his foothold in that spiral, believe me, the accuser of the brethren is going to do everything he can to destroy you and discourage you from what God has for your life. It's what he does. He's been doing it for a long time. And he can get it the best of us, right? That's why we got to be vigilant. It's like he's looking for that opening to just send you, you know, and hopefully, to him, hopefully he can make you quit, right? That's what he's trying to do. Keep your head. Trust the Lord. Look to God for leading in those situations. God has something for you. So not only that, he says, but you keep your head in all situations. And on top of that, endure hardships. Be willing to endure some hardships, and what you'll find is this, real life, real joy, and real happiness are found in and by going through the hard places. That's where the growth happens. I mean, the analogy is super simple, and you can see it if you, if you even go over to Israel someday where, where the origin of so much of this was written and comprised that if you go there you'll see the mountains look just bare right and all the growth all the lushness all the water all the you know that's happening in the valleys that's happening in the valleys so yeah sometimes that's where the tough stuff is that's where the trial is but we don't really grow too much on the mountaintop experiences they're really good but there's nothing there challenging you to get you to grow Endure hardships. There has to be a battle to know victory. All of us want to experience and know victory. How do you do that without a battle? There has to be a conflict to learn how to be a peacemaker. There has to be a problem to become a person who can find solutions. You can't get around it without hardship. And it's in the valley of trials that things really begin to grow. And you'll know that you're getting close to where you should be when you truly become grateful for the trials that you've gone through. Yes. Amen. When you truly start to see the fruit of it, and you look back on it and you're like, God, I wouldn't change that time no matter how hard it was. I wouldn't change that time for all the money in the world. It's more valuable than anything because, God, it changed me. It shaped my character. It made me afraid not to go through the next thing. It built my faith in you. All of those things, right? When you truly start to, to do this, keep your head, endure hardships, you'll start to 
reap the fruit of that that is like, it's more precious than gold. What God produces in you during those times. And here's the other thing I want to encourage you in. If you're in a hard place right now, where it feels like you've just been treading water, or the, the good times, the harvest of this sowing in tears and sorrow and everything else, if you're in that season right now, the good harvest is going to come. I have a friend who's, um, he pastors, and I, I don't need to say who it is, but he's been, he's been doing it for a long time. He looks young. He's like me. He looks young. Um, <laughs> you can't believe they've been doing it as long as they've been doing it, but yeah, they've been doing it. So, um, but he's been doing it a long time, and I've known him for a long time, and I remember when he was going through those difficult patches, the, the times where you question, should I even still be doing this? Is this still what God has for me? And, you know, it's during those seasons where we all lean on those scriptures like in Galatians about don't grow weary in well-doing for in due season you will reap a harvest if you don't lose heart and faint, right? And we always, we always cling to that. We always cling to that. It's like, I know the harvest is coming. I just want to assure you today that the harvest actually does come. Because I, I saw him go through as hard a patch as anybody can go through in the ministry and even in his own family. And now to see what God is doing in them, in their church, in his life, it's like this, this explosion of God's blessings are happening. And I told him the other week, I was spending some time with him, I said, hey, you are an encouragement to me because it's working for you, right? It's working for you. We always say the scripture, don't lose heart and faint. Don't grow weary in well-doing. It's like, but you're in the harvest now. You're in the harvest now. So it works, right? If you're in that place where it's like you feel like it's just tough right now and it's, God, I'm not growing weary. I'm sowing. I'm doing all of this stuff. But when's it going to change? I promise you it will change. The last, I would say, four years of my life have been honestly on every single level of my life. I would say the last four years of my life have been the most difficult and trying that I've ever gone through. And I wouldn't even dare to like, why or, you know, believe me, many of my wounds wind up being self-inflicted. Right, so you know there were situations that happened. COVID happened. Everything happened. Right, it, for a lot of us, it's been a tough season. But for me, the last four years of my life have been the toughest. And yet now, now I truly see the harvest coming. Not just not just with this church, but in my own life, in my marriage, with my children, with. I see the harvest happening, and I'm even able to say in my situation, God, your word is true. Don't grow weary. Keep going. Don't quit. Endure hardships. So if you're in that place right now where it feels like I'm just still in the grind and I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, it's coming. I promise you God's word is true. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Keep your head, keep your head, endure hardships. God has something good on the way. Now, you have to be intentional about it because we have become very good at insulating ourselves from problems and passing off the lack of turmoil as the blessings of God. And that's something you can do in this country pretty easily. You can handle your relationships through social media, and if something isn't the way you like it, unfriend that person. Block them, right? You can, you can escape tough financial situations by taking shortcuts out of it. You can do all kinds of different things, especially here in the amazing United States of America. You can get it done. So we have become very good at insulating ourselves from problems and passing off the lack of turmoil as the blessings of God. But 
in spite of that, in our culture today, there is more clinical depression than there ever has been in history. So is what we're doing working when we do that? No, no. What works is keeping your head and enduring hardship. Now, I'll just read these next few verses to get to the next section. Um, starting at verse six, it says, this is Paul speaking. He says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who have longed for his appearing. To finish up here this morning, I want to take a quick look at just Paul's example in his life to us of seeing these things play out. Um, there is no official rating system for Christians, right? So this, this, this statement always kind of hits me wrong, and yet I understand why people make it, and it makes me want to make it too, if that makes any sense. But Paul is arguably the greatest Christian who ever lived. I mean, when you think about the impact that he had on the kingdom of God, now I know that the kingdom of God and God's children are not measured in that way, but what an impact that Paul had for the kingdom of God. So I was thinking about it, like what did it look like for him as he was keeping his head, as he was enduring hardship, what did it look like for him to be in the will and the favor of the Lord? Because we know that he was. We know that he was. We know that God was pleased with the Apostle Paul. So what did that look like? In verse 9, and we, we sort of touched on this earlier with how people can disappoint you. Verse 9, Paul starts to give his... Um, is kind of signing off for this message. But he says, do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to, Thess to Thessalonica. And Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to, <sighs> I would say Dalmatia, but I know that's the wrong way to pronounce it. So, Paul is having to deal with, in this moment, the grief of desertion in his circumstance, which is a tough one that he's in. He's dealing with these people who have left him in the heat of the battle, left him when he needed them most, left him as he's imprisoned. Paul needed these people, and he says, but they deserted me. Now listen to the next part in verse 11. He says, only Luke is with me. But he says, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. It's ironic to me that Paul says, these are the people who deserted me, but bring Mark to me because he's helpful to me. And what happened with Mark and Paul? Mark had deserted Paul. In fact, it had caused such a division between him and Barnabas that they parted ways. And that's when Paul got a new partner in ministry, Silas, right? Because he didn't want to give Mark a second chance. Mark was this guy who had deserted him. But now in this situation, in Paul's time of need, he says, these people de deserted me, but bring Mark back to me, right? Because he is helpful to me. Paul's bitterness, as I said, cost him his partner in ministry. But now he says, I want him back. And what I like about this is there's an example here about going through something difficult. And that's this, let go of the bitterness of your situation right now. Whatever it is, the unfairness, the, the inequity of what you're dealing with, whether it's in your workplace, in your home, in your finances, Inequity, how many people are so bitter about the media right now because it seems so biased and unfair, right? And it's all, right? Let go of all the bitterness of your situation 
because your greatest disappointments can end up becoming your greatest blessings. You're gonna have to allow God to be glorified in that situation. It's just so fascinating to me that Paul, as he's listing the people who have presently deserted him, thinks back to one who deserted him earlier and said, but he is so helpful to me, right? Does that make sense, church? Allow God to have those situations. Don't let that root of bitterness set in. Allow God to have it, and what was such a hardship for you can end up becoming your greatest blessing, your greatest blessing. What else did it look like for Paul to be serving the Lord? He said, I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus and Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. He says, hey, bring me a coat. I'm cold. Paul was in a time of need. And so many times we think of need as an indicator of God's displeasure. But it's not. We always, you know, we fall into the same, um, we fall into that same sort of fallacy, that question of who sinned because we're going through this hardship? Who sinned because this person was born this way? Who sinned because, you know, I don't feel like I have enough money right now? Who sinned because my car blew up? Who sinned, right? And so many of those things, they almost just lean into like superstition after a while. Need is not an indicator of God's displeasure. This was an opportunity for God to be glorified by the bringing of the coat. I think about being the guy, right, who got to bring the Apostle Paul his coat. It's like, you know, like if, if it's me and Paul is my mentor, if he's the one who's discipling me and teaching me, and it's like he says, bring me a coat. It's getting cold over here. For me to do that, to bless that person in that way, right, I'm going to move heaven and earth to make sure that he gets that coat, right? The need that you're going through, as I said, it's not an indicator of God's displeasure. It is an opportunity for God to be glorified in your situation. And it very likely is providing the place that God needed to be able to use someone. It's an opportunity. He goes on to say in verse 14, Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. Again, is, is hardship the indicator that he was out of the will of God? No, it's the indicator that what he was doing was effective. Alexander the coppersmith was a coppersmith making idols. And Paul was winning so many people for Jesus that people weren't buying this guy's idols anymore. He was literally putting the idol shop out of business. So this enemy begins to attack him and persecute him. Again, be, just because you're going through something hard right now, it may be the enemy attacking you because God is doing great things in your life. Amen. It's not necessarily, oh, God has forsaken me. God is, right? It's not that. It's not that. God loves you more than you could possibly ever know. And the battle was proof of the effectiveness I'm trying to do the right thing, but everything's going wrong. Has anybody ever said that? Like, God, I'm trying to do exactly what you want me to do. I'm obeying your word, and I keep running into all these hard things. I've had that gripe and complaint with God more times than I could possibly count. Well, the hardship probably means you're doing a good job of it. You're doing a good job of it. The battle was proof of the effectiveness. And here's what I wonder sometimes. 
Who told you it would be different than that? How do we get it into our heads that, no, this, you know, if I'm doing what God wants me to do, this should just be going swimmingly. It should be easy. It should look exactly the way I want it to look. No. No, you're going to have to keep your head and endure hardships as you're doing what God wants you to do. I'll finish up with this. He says, at my first offense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them because the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that, I love it. He says, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it, and I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that. See, every one of us, just you can internalize this here. Every one of us has something that you've either gone through or you're going through right now. And maybe you have your own story to where you can look at it and say, but I know it was so that, right? God has a so that for each one of us. God, you let me go through this so that I would be able to do the next battle in a different kind of victory or whatever it is. It's that hindsight, it's so 2020, right? Where we can look back on it and go, oh God, now I see what your plan was. Everything I was going through was so that. The key is, is being, <laughs> being able to remember it going forward. Because when you're in it, when you're in the thick of it, when you feel miserable, and you just, sometimes it just feels like whatever it is, you would do anything to get out of it, right? It's in those times where you have to remember, I know there is a so that, that someday I'm going to be able to look back on it. It's going to make perfect sense to me, but right now I can't. But God has a so that for each one of you. You have one on the way. Don't give up. Don't give up. I know it's a hard thing while you're going through something, right? And again, I, I wish I could be more specific, but I just find that life is so diverse for each and every one of us that if I start listing examples, whether it's marriage stuff or financial stuff or health stuff, or I mean, the possibilities are endless to what the struggle is that you're going through right now, right? I find that it's very rare that we have no battles happening in our life. You know, I I've, haven't had a lot of times in my life where I could just go, you know what, everything is just perfect right now. You know, I haven't had a ton of seasons like that. There's usually some sort of trial, something happening, but with each and every one of those, God has allowed you to be in this place so that... And God is standing by your side to make sure that you get through it and get that harvest on the other side of it so that, right, there is something for you on the other side of this. And it's going to be good. The key to getting there, it's so simple. It's so simple. Keep your head and endure hardships. God's got something for you in this. He finishes by saying, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. What a great reminder, too, that not only does God have something for you in this life, you've got an eternal victory on the way as well. Amen. Every battle will be one forever. And that's going to be awesome. That's going to be awesome. Let's pray, church. And when I say let's pray, like in your own heart, whatever the Holy Spirit has been kind of prompting or nudging at in this moment, bring that before Jesus. Lord, 
We thank you, God, that in every difficult, grinding type situation, Lord, we know that you have a plan and a purpose, Lord, that is going to bring good and awesome things, God, that there is going to be a wonderful harvest from it, Jesus, and that you're letting us go through this right now, Lord, so that it can be revealed so that, God, you can be glorified in another situation, so that, God, we can bear much fruit for your kingdom, so that, God, we can be the, the man or woman of God that you have designed us to be, so that we get these weak character flaws and deficiencies and uh, aspects of trauma and everything that we've gone through refined out of us, God, so that, Lord, we would know your goodness, God, and look forward with expectation to being with you for an eternity, Jesus. There is always a so that, Lord, so that. So, God, I pray, Lord, for each and every heart, each and every soul in this room today, Lord, that, God, there would be a comfort and a peace that surpasses all understanding because, God, they know that your plans for them are good and sure and thorough and that, Lord, you know each and every one of us, you have called us by name. You know us better than we could ever know ourselves, Lord. Such knowledge like that is too wonderful for us, God, but you have it. You have it, God. Lord, I pray against despair and discouragement today, Lord. If anybody has just been feeling that, that kind of burnt out, what's the purpose, what's the point type emotion, Lord, I pray that that would be gone in Jesus' name, and God, they would begin to look forward to your purpose, God, and the harvest, Lord, that is surely on the way. It is surely on the way, God. The harvest is coming, Lord. So God, I just, I, I pray, Lord, that, and even rebuke this, Lord, that every, um, every dis feeling and spirit of despair and every attack, Lord, that has come from the enemy, Lord, we just rebuke that in Jesus' name. God, there is no reason that no matter what we're going through in life, there is no reason that we can't have a joy and a peace that comes from you, Lord. I thank you for this, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Lord, you got us. You got us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Love you guys. There's going to be some fun stuff coming up throughout the rest of this year. So, yeah.